King's first negative to Proposition B, Third Night. Brother Nichols, moderators, and ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be back this evening to continue our discussion of things that are dealing with end-time matters. We commonly refer to this as eschatology. That is a term that is not found in the Bible. And sometimes we use terms that are not there in the exact wording. I don't know if my opponent this evening was objecting to the fact that we use words that are not in the Bible. But clearly, the meaning of Bible phrases and teaching, I don't believe he was, has any objections to this. I remember having heard a speaker say one time that the words adverb and adjective are not in the Bible. But we find quite a few of them there. So far as the meaning of language is concerned, that's why I feel that in communicating the truth of God's word, we must use language that is best suited in order that the audience can gain the real meaning and the real spirit of truth of God's word. Brother Nichols feels that, that we have failed to do this in the discussion of eschatology. So perhaps in his affirmatives and my reply to the negative, we will be able to further clarify the things that he feels have not been thus far done. Eschatology is the doctrine or discussion of last things, as he pointed out. The Bible has a doctrine of last things. His affirmative this evening, as he has defined it, deals with last things. I believe he will agree with this. It is also a doctrine of last things that I believe that he will agree with this. So, since the religious world has been using the term eschatology for centuries in relation to end time things, then I suspect we could well profit by the use of the term, which is familiar to the religious world and may even profit by becoming more familiar with it ourselves. He has defined his position on last things, and I think Brother Nichols has done an excellent job in defining his proposition you will notice that there is a contrast between his definition of last things and the one that I gave the first two nights in my affirmatives. The difference lies basically in the field of time and manner in which these things are to come to pass, or did come to pass. In the case of Brother Nichols, they are to come to pass, yet in the future. In my conviction of the Bible, and my understanding of the Bible, these things have already come to pass. It is the burden of the affirmative this evening and tomorrow evening to show that these things are not yet come to pass and to show that the Bible teaches that they extend beyond the 20th century or at least up to that time. We have shown from the time statements in the Bible that the time for these things was at hand and they were going to shortly come to pass. Brother Nichols has appealed this evening to the book of Revelation in a book of end time things and therefore I feel he is going to hold to this book as dealing with things yet to come. I disagree with this and one of the reasons for the disagreement is based on this plain simple unequivocal time statement and if that's confusing then I can only offer an apology for the language of the scripture. When it says at hand I don't believe that I'm using terms that are confusing to an audience. When I say shortly to come to pass, I don't believe it should be difficult for someone to understand in the audience what is meant. I was very careful to stress the fact that the whole program of eschatology in the New Testament is presented in the plain language of those plain time statements. Therefore, Peter said he was writing to the end time. The end of all things is at hand. That's a plain statement. The end of all things is at hand, 1 Peter 4, 7. Concerning the judgment, he said, the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. That's a plain statement. The time is come, he said. He did not say will come, sometime down through the centuries, or sometime in the future. The time is come. That judgment must begin at the house of God. Jesus said, before this generation passes, all these things shall be fulfilled. Matthew 24, verse 34. That leads us then to a consideration of the text that deals with all these things. And all of these things must be backed up to the threefold question of verse 3. What shall be the time of the destruction of the temple? 
and the sign of your coming. Notice the sign of your coming and of the end of the world. Jesus did not say there was no sign of his coming, but proceeded to give signs not only of his coming, but also of the end of the world. Because the signs are applied to both. They are both the same in time and event. The coming of Jesus and the end of the world. So, he tells us very plainly of some things that would take place, so we wouldn't misunderstand. When ye see the abomination of desolation, spoken by Daniel the prophet, then you know the time is here. Let him that is in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him on the housetop not come down. And he said, all these things shall be fulfilled before this generation passes. I don't know what your conception of generation is, but if I did not make clear what generation means, it is only because I took for granted that you have a working knowledge of the word generation. And when Jesus said this generation, he was talking about the one he was in when he said it. So I concluded that it would be the one in which he would come again. And in the final part of the affirmative tonight, my worthy opponent said that there were several comings of Jesus Christ, but I failed to find anything about the one in Matthew 24. So evidently, he feels that this belongs to the future, what he calls the second coming of Christ. But how he can get it out of that generation, then Jesus said just two verses before, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and in glory, I don't know. If my interpretation is strange in Bible language, and if it is confusing to people, then I apologize for trying to repeat just what is in the scripture. I don't believe his charges are exactly fair and according to the truth of the matter. Now, brethren, one of the problems in this study, and this is just number one that he brings up, which I feel I related to what he wanted to meet in our negative this evening, he said the Bible was written in the language of common terms, and then implies that my presentation of truth of God's word was not in those common terms of the Bible. You may be the judge of the merit of that statement. I talked about the tabernacle, temple, priesthood, and everything that was typified in material form under the Old Testament, and how it had a spiritual fulfillment under the New Testament. He feels that because we put things in a spiritual field, that this is vague, and this is indefinite. He feels that this makes everything hard to understand. But do you know what makes a thing hard to understand? It is putting it in the background of the wrong kind of understanding. The thing that makes something easy to understand is to bring the proper background to it. And the understanding of the New Testament depends upon a proper understanding of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was used as a type, a pattern, and a shadow of things to come. If we don't understand what was there, we're going to miss the application that is made by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. I believe that the world has a language and a wisdom that changes even from generation to generation. We have concepts of things that come through customs and traditions and our background learning and many times we become so infiltrated with this experience and this knowledge and this language of the world that this is the thing we bring to the scriptures in the interpretation of the scriptures, and that gets us into trouble many times. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 2, 19 to 13, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God now we have received talking of the apostles and the other inspired men of that day not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God why that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God in the spirit of the world those things could never be discerned which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. And I'm contending that eschatology, or the doctrine of last things, is going to have to be presented in the language of the Holy Spirit, beginning in the Old Testament, and out of this must come 
the shaping and the forming of the concepts of God's eternal purpose to which we bring in the interpretation of the New Testament, the fulfillment of these things. And if we bring the wisdom of this world to it, then we might even make the mistake of thinking that the world that was ending in that day was the material world rather than the world of Judaism. We might even make the mistake that the world to come is a physical material world instead of one typified in Judaism. And that's the way the world thinks. Do you realise that we're dealing this week with a topic and a subject that is perhaps the most controversial and most diversified in view of any subject in the Bible? It has been for centuries. Why is this true? I believe it's because the language of the Holy Spirit has been ignored and sometimes when it's brought forth it sounds like strange teaching to some people who may not have given careful consideration to the language of the Holy Spirit. I'm speaking of the language of the Holy Spirit whenever I talk about this world, the world to come, in an application of the Jewish world and of the Christian world, because that is the very thing and the only thing that you can make out of the typical patterns of the Old Testament in connection with that which was to come in a state of fulfillment in the New Testament. But if we leave this teaching and this language of the Holy Spirit and go out and talk the language of the man in the street and speak about this world and the world to come, then probably we'll begin to filter out here into some of the concepts of eschatology that are very prominent in the field of premillennialism. Whether it be post, pre, mid-tribulation or what have you, or whether it be dispensationalism, there are various forms and manifestations of it because we're not bringing to the New Testament scriptures a proper understanding. This is true because we start with the New Testament rather than start where God started. God started in the Old Testament and he took his time, as Brother Nichols pointed out the other night. He said he headed for Pentecost. I agree with that, but he didn't put his brakes on there. He headed for Pentecost and when he got to Pentecost, he began through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to fulfill what he had purposed and planned and laid the foundation for since the day of Adam, 4,000 years of preparatory work, and then to fulfill it. I'm suggesting tonight that may be some of the strangeness of the statements that are made from time to time with reference to end times things. is because we did not go back to the beginning of things in the typical form and state and learn what the purpose of God was. Now, further in the definition of this affirmative, he went on to death first. That's the point number two that I have. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. Hebrews 9, verse 27. Well, I believe that scripture. I know Brother Nichols believes it. I'm not sure what his concept of it is, and probably he feels he's not sure what my concept is. But we're going to try and find out before this evening is over. He made the statement that some of these things I did not discuss in my first affirmatives or the first two nights of my affirmatives. I hope Brother Nichols will realise, and I believe he does, because he's going to have the same problem. I hope he realises that we're dealing with a subject that is far greater in scope than the time period assigned it here. I am disappointed that I could not cover more material that I wanted to cover, realising that even if I did so, then I had only scratched the surface. But if he feels that I have not covered enough, he is welcome to continue this discussion, and we'll just keep on till it's finished. The original agreement was that there would be a return discussion at Henderson, Tennessee, if the elders invited us. And the elders at Henderson chose not to. I presume, I believe this is correct, or we're not interested. And so that has limited this debate. Now, of course, we consented to go ahead and have it at Warren with the realisation that the proposition was far extended beyond four nights' time. But I wanted the brethren here at Warren to hear what Brother Nichols had to say on this subject. I wanted my members here, the church members here, where I preached to hear the other side. And I told him to come right ahead. If the brethren down at Henderson, Tennessee did not want this debate, we'll go ahead and have it anyway. I think it's a tragedy. I think it's very unfair when a Christian school will bring a man's doctrine under attack by choosing a speaker to come and speak on it and then will not afford an opportunity 
to defence. But this is perhaps besides the point. We nevertheless agreed to this debate, knowing it would be hard to cover all the propositions. But whatever he feels I have not covered, if I cannot do it tonight in the negative, or tomorrow night, I will just spend the rest of my days talking about it. If he wants to do the same, I'd do it every night. I'd talk it day and night. I love to study the Bible. I enjoy this study. It is a thrilling study to me. I hope, brethren, if we do nothing more than just get you involved a little bit deeper in the study of things concerning end time subjects, that it will be worth the while. I always want to have the spirit and attitude of the Bereans, who were more noble than they of Thessalonica, and that is to study the scriptures and search them daily with an open mind, and that's how we're going to profit by these things. Well, he says, I understand him correctly, that Hebrews 9.27 has to apply to the body because the soul does not die. He made that statement last night, that since Adam... To the day of Christ, souls did not die. I find that hard to understand and to accept from a biblical point of view. I don't know what Brother Nichols means when he says the soul doesn't die. I have always believed that there is a death of the soul. In fact, I've always believed that is that that is what Jesus came to rescue us from, the death of the soul. Now that's a view really that I have never taken on till now, but he has the view. I suppose it's because he's going to limit death to the physical body and the restoration of that physical body. I believe then that that we'll have to pursue this further. He defined it. I'm not sure that it's clear, but if it's clear to you, then you're just that much brighter than I am. He gave John 5:28 as proof that all that are in the grave were going to come forth I believe that scripture, every word of it. I don't know if I believe his application or not. He just did not enlarge upon it. What kind of grave is that? Well, he defined the grave of John 5.28. Will he define the grave of John 5.28? Is he talking about a grave out there in the cemetery where you dig a hole and put in a physical body? Is that the grave? Now, I think we ought to get plain and specific then on these terms. Then he talks about the day of judgment, Acts 17, verse 31, as the result of which all men were commanded to repent. I believe in the day of judgment, just like the one in Acts 17, 31, as taught in the scriptures. I believe the scriptures teach a day of judgment, and it was a day that necessitated the repenting of all men not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles, because of the nature of the Day of Judgment and of the things that were going to transpire in that day. He then referred to 2 Peter 3 as proof that this physical heaven and earth shall be destroyed. We'll notice then his further affirmation on that, that I deny. Time called.